Hello and welcome to Independent Podcast Service. I'm Paul. And I'm Dave. And this week we're talking about the episode of Kolchak the Night Stalker called Mr. Ring. This episode originally aired January 10th, 1975. Alrighty, so we're in a new year now, Dave. Um, number one film at the box office to start 1975. A very good question. But also one with my experience, I do not know. Not even a guess? Eh, again, with the things I know of that came up at the time, even with that, it's like nothing super socially significant that I can immediately think of. Alrighty. So, um, it is the same as it was last time. It is still The Godfather Part 2. No, that's understandable, completely. Yes, yes it is. Uh, Number one song in America this week, Dave. Another interesting question. Because on the one hand, I'm not sure it's the one that I still think it is with how popular it is. Then nothing else immediately... I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to give you a hint, Dave. It's a cover. Oh, jeez. Now we're starting to head into covers now. Uh. It's a popular song with a cover. There's thoughts, but. Uh, I'll give you another hint. It's a cover of a Beatles song. Pretty much the only one thing that popped up in my mind is the. Not sure of the title exactly, but it's the Here Comes the Sun one. Dave, you know I know nothing about the Beatles, right? (laughs) Duly noted. Uh, It's a Beatles song covered by a Beatle. Maybe that'll help a little. You'd think so, but sadly, no. I still got nothing. Uh, It's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by Elton John. No, that makes sense. Alrighty, and I figured quickly because uh, we did 1974, so we're going to do 75. Um, we're going to talk about the video games of 1975. Oh my gosh, we have new video games in 1975. <laughs> we do. Or, or do we essentially just have all the games from 1974 that everyone else and their grandma decide to try and make a cup, of another version of to sell in 1975? Um, well, you know, let's go through it. Uh, so these are all obviously arcade units, um, and we're going to go through the top 10 selling arcade cabinets of, of the year. So, uh, number one is Wheels slash Wheels 2, also known as Speed Race, developed by Taito and manufactured by Midway, which is obviously a racing game. Yes, because nothing screams arcade game like a video game cabinet with a steering wheel. Yeah, it was a good gimmick to get people to play. Uh, number two is Tank slash Tank Two by Key Game, developed by Key Games, manufactured by Key Games, and that is a maze game. Okay, because the first thought was just a typical tank sort of one, but yeah, what's that I, I one think it tank? is. But like, you have to like guide your tank through like a maze to get to an objective or something. Mm-hmm. Is kind of what it looks like. Uh, so, 3 is possibly the greatest name for a video game ever. <laughs> it's called Flim Flam. On the one hand, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. It is a banger. But additionally, it's one of the particular things that leaves me asking, what? Uh, it was developed and manufactured by Meadows Games, and it is a Pong knockoff. Well, I suppose if someone had to rename Pong to something, they could come up with worse names, I suppose. Uh, Next up is Grand Track 20, which is a racing game developed and manufactured by Atari. No, that's understandable. Uh, Next is PT-109, which is a shooter manufactured and developed by Micro Games. Yes. Uh, after that, we have Avenger, which is developed and manufactured by Electra Games and is also a shooter. No, that also makes sense. Uh, next. It was... <laughs> no, that still might be a ways away before really going to the 
uh, machine type games that have the actual gun and attached to them. Oh yeah, I don't think those came around till maybe like the eighties. Yeah, not till then. That was probably like five or six years off still. Yeah. Um. Next up is Crash and Score, uh, manufactured and developed by Atari, and that was a driving game. Uh, next up is Gunfight, also known as Western Gun, which was developed by Taito and manufactured by Midway, and that is a shooter game. Because uh, of yeah, yeah. Uh, next up is Jet Fighter, uh, developed and manufactured by Atari, which is also a shooter. Shocking. Uh, oh, next... Is it the typical gun shooter or more so of the asteroid shooter shooting things off the screen? Um, it is hard to tell from the poster. Mm. Um, from what I can see, it looks more like an asteroid style kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, wait, there's a gameplay synopsis here. Let me see. Um, the players fly in simulated jets around the screen, engaging in a dogfight and attempting to score hits on their opponent within a limited amount of time asteroids yeah kind of uh the next up is shark jaws which was developed and manufactured by atari and that is an action game uh, understandable so i question how long the period would be yeah. <laughs> this uh so this was an unofficial tie-in to an unlicensed tie-in to the movie jaws which apparently yes, they you know it's the thing that was done Apparently they got in a little bit of trouble over and had to change the name because initially they released it as just Jaws, and then they Did had you know, what's copyright law or any sort of thing with that. It's no issue. Uh, it was retitled as oh no the, yeah they initially planned to release it as Jaws but they couldn't get the license so they added the word shark in very tiny font. Yeah, so... that's usually one of the best tricks for it. <laughs> that's my favorite. Uh, and finally, at the 10th spot, we have a game called Steeplechase, which was developed and manufactured by Atari, and that is a racing game. Understandable. Still a marvelous case of, there's essentially only three games, but everyone can make about 16 different versions of it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, uh, some major events from this year. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, Megan Fox discontinued the original Odyssey. Oh, so sad. Which was actually kind of a big deal, because I think that's technically the first, like, home console. It or was one of the ones before Atari tried to do the thing and then caused all things to explode. Yeah. It might be the first with, like, removable cartridges. I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, who cares about that? Uh, Sega, who at the time made an arcade game called Bullet Mark... Uh, which uh, changes... Oh, they just changed their logo. Who cares? Um, well, you know with Sega how fairly still and set within the gaming sphere it kind of is. Kind of probably getting its first steps to getting really into the console section of things. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, when did the Master System come out? Because I feel like that's not for a good couple of years, right? might still be a couple of years, possibly around the mid-80s or so. Uh, Master System was released uh, in Japan in 85. Mm -hmm. And it's still going in Brazil, by the way. You can still get them there, apparently. Nah, that's understandable. Um, oh, here's an interesting thing. Uh, I'll, this will be the last thing I'll bring up, and then we'll move on to you know what we're actually here to talk about. Indeed. But... Um, uh, Nürburgring, uh, which was a game developed in Germany, was the first first-person racing game, and that was released this year. Uh, it was like an arcade uh, cabinet yeah. stood up where you had the steering wheel, and like it was like a you know like a first-person game. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it usually seems to be the thing case with Tetris and a couple other things. Always good work from the Germans. Alrighty. So, let us move on to Kolchak the Night Stalker. Um, alrighty. So, this episode...
<clears throat> I'm going to read off the opening narration and then we'll get into the episode. So, uh, on April 12th, Sunday, 11.25 p.m., Professor uh, Avery Walker was working late. Profos Professor Walker was a member of a crack team of researchers, but tonight he was working alone. He had received specific orders, and being a fastidious man, he intended to uh, carry out... Uh, he intended carrying out those orders to the letter. Kolchak is a, assigned to write the obituary of Professor Walker, but soon begins an investigation when no one will tell him straight out how the scientist died. On the quiet streets, Postal Van drives by. 1.15 the same night, postal worker uh, Arnold Techman was an hour behind. Techman was addicted to hot Texas chili, but it always made him sick and late. That made, uh, that made the mail arrive late, but tomorrow... It would arrive even later. A mysterious figure sneaks up behind Techman and hurls him into a conveniently placed pile of crates, then steals his uniform. In the next scene, the same mysterious figure stands outside a novelty store, looks over the masks in the window, then breaks in and steals a blue one that is kind of human-looking. Meanwhile, Carl drives to the Walker House, the Walker House and sees that there is a car parked outside the street and the driver is intently watching the house. The driver makes a call on his car phone. Uh, Carl interviews the widow of uh, Professor Walker. He asks for details about how the professor died, but Mrs. Walker will only say uh, that he had a heart attack. Carl asks... Uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Mrs. Carl Walker will say will only say they said it was a heart attack. Carl asks who they is, and she tells him the doctors at the Ty Tyrell Institute where he was working. Carl asks what type of government work he was doing, and Miss Walker said, I just told you, secret. All I know is that it had something to do with a ring. She tells Carl that uh, they most likely let uh, Dr. Leslie Dwyer see him. Dwyer works with her, worked with her late husband, and Miss Walker suspects the two were having an affair. In the meantime, the mysterious figure, still see, still wearing the stolen uh, postal uniform, breaks into the Glengarry uh, mortuary, and when confronted, throws a construction worker and a cop aside like rag dolls. When Kolchak shows up to interview the staff, the mortuary owner, a man named Carmichael, tells Carl that he and his assistant discovered the figure stealing putty, uh, like cosmetology makeup and stuff. Carl then heads to the Tyrell Institute to speak with Dwyer. He inquires about Ring, but is met with a stony silence. In the next scene, the figure uh, tears off the side mirror from a van and starts applying the freshly stolen mortuary uh, wax onto uh, his, like, mask. Uh, the next day, Carl is updating Tony on his investigation, but Tony wants to send him to San Francisco due to an emergency with Ron. He even includes a huge expense account, which immediately makes Carl suspicious. Is the government on to him and his investigation? That same evening at 11.20, Leslie Dyer is confronted in her apartment by the figure who kidnaps her. Carl again updates Tony on his investigation and says that Professor Walker, Leslie Dwyer, and the Tyrell Institute are creating, were creating the first robot with artificial intelligence, and that when Walker tried to shut down the robot, he killed the professor. Carl concludes that Ring is the name of the robot. Meanwhile, the government is threatening to block INS use of the International Wire, claiming there is an uprising in El Salvador. Kolchak drives out to Dwyer's apartment and again grills her. She finally admits that Ring stands for, oh god, Robomatic Internalized Nerve Ganglia, and that it killed Walker to protect itself. Ring then tracks down Dwyer to, uh, Ring then tracks down Dwyer to instruct it in moral behavior. Ring crashes through the door and heads toward Kolchak. Dwyer tells Ring to stop, and it does. Several cop cars and army jeeps. Uh, arrives surrounding Dwyer's apartment, and the colonel calls for everyone to surrender. The soldiers advance on the robot who goes haywire and starts attacking them. One soldier shoots Ring in the chest, Kolchak takes several pictures, but is dragged away by the soldiers and is drugged. In the end, Carl is sitting at his desk, tape recorder in hand. I can't even be sure that the events ever happened the way I told them. Perhaps I'm when I'm completely back in this world, I'll turn on this tape and not believe any of it myself, but I doubt it, because I believe that somewhere, someplace, they or someone else will, will put uh, some other ring together without the help of Leslie Dwyer, and who, who will program him then? So that was the episode we watched, and what did you think of it, Mr. David? It's always definitely interesting with them going more into a robot story, especially with it gaining sentience a decent dozen of books 
have most likely been published with this kind of idea in mind. Mm. And it's definitely interesting with how the story sort of started up, short of going with the idea of how is this robot functioning and what is its thought process of how it's supposedly going through things and whatnot. But especially with the interactions with Kolchak once he meets it, that he runs through the basic simple questions. And interestingly, the simple questions. What's the time? Dude, you get a better answer if you looked at a clock. It's not what I made for. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it is an interesting concept, and it's kind of like more relevant today than it was in, in the 70s. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting sort of thought there's been a couple of things that were made at the, around the time that could simulate it, but definitely not to the point of we're making things today that can do similar sort of things like that. Yeah, no, I think it. I think it's a pretty good episode. Um, it's one of. The, I think it's one of the ones that like is kind of let down by the technology of the time because the robot does not look convincing. It is very clearly. Uh, a man in a bodysuit with some stuff stuck to his face. Yeah, yeah. Again, that can't be helped. Yeah, but no, think, totally. But I think one of the interesting sort of bits that they went with was, I think, a simple one of it is the mindset of a young child or something just starting but not really having a real concept of how things work. It doesn't understand how strong it is, uh, how to react to certain stimuli, and especially with a um, couple of Kolchak's questions after he speaks them. They're good questions to ask, but I question whether or not it's the best to ask. Like, how do you tell something good, something wrong from right? The yeah. robot's just left wondering. But it is interesting enough for the concept of this is probably decent enough sort of thing to go along with the story. But of course, the main finance behind it is the military, which is... Mm. Yeah, and like it, the professor even says, like, well, that's not a fair question to ask him because like, like none of us could really answer, like, how do you determine what's right from wrong? Like, you can't give like a concrete answer to that question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I quite... I like this episode more than I remembered, actually. Okay. Uh, I remembered it being one of my one of my lesser favorite ones. Um, one that I probably wouldn't return to that often. But actually, I was like, you know what? This was better than I remembered. It's still not, like, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, yeah. I think it's a very middling episode because it's not, like... Like, last week we had Horror in the Heights, which I genuinely really liked. And then later we're going to get into some episodes that are just really dumb and not very good, but they're funny. Mm. This one just kind of sits in the middle where it's it's interesting, but it kind of never gets to being really great. Yeah, it's so true. And again, there were a couple of at least highlights within the episode, aside from the interesting ideas. Because, again, you cannot deny the start of that episode of Polchak coming in, nice chipper attitude... Uh, saying goodbye to his cohort that was heading off to take care of his story, coming in and hearing from uh, Lincenzo that he supposedly went up to do a news report when he really was going up to go fishing, kind of get a day off, and then have it completely bite him in the ass by saying that his original story, if he came in the work, would have been to go to San Francisco, uh, getting all particular sorts of things together essentially would have been a decent vacation for him, but instead getting stuck on this story. Yeah, no, the, yeah. I, I really did like that, and I like how, like, Kolchak is just like, I San Fran you sent Ron to San Francisco. <laughs> it's a very good little kind of kind of moment. Pretty much ends the episode with him looking through his couple files, shuts the case up, and just slams his head on the desk. Just like, ha, ah, marvelous. Yeah, no, it was it, it's a, it's a fun ep like it's a good episode, but it's probably it's not one that if somebody said like I need I should wa like what three episodes should I watch to understand the show, it wouldn't be on that list for me. No, that's definitely true. And I think it's another case of they were also experimenting with a couple of things around at the time, and especially with the couple episodes you showed me and what 
really kind of the focus Kolchak uh, goes through with this. It's one of the ones that kind of airs a little bit on the side of this is starting to push into different sort of ideas. This is more instead of mystery uh, horror sort of elements to it, it starts to head more into crime show uh, sort of cases with it. Yeah, and like I don't even mind like him doing these kind of like more sci-fi things. It's just I feel like there could have been maybe a more interesting you could have maybe done something more interesting with this premise because I think the premise is strong. No, that's definitely true, though sort of thinking on it. I'm not sure how you could push it into a better range for it without kind of going into the really out there or completely absurd kind of ideas of it. Yeah, and it's also a thing where you would have to make it where you could air it in 1975. So, like, that also yeah. is going to limit what you can do. Mm hmm so true. Yeah. So, uh, if you have nothing else about this episode, I have a little fun piece of trivia about this one, actually. Um, so, you know how this episode featured the Tyrell Institute? Yes. Did that name ring any bells for you? Not off the top of my head or when I was watching the episode, no. Okay, so the Tyrell Institute is also the company which creates the replicants in Blade Runner. Mm. So I thought that was kind of a kind of a fun little little piece of trivia. Obviously Blade Runner would come out uh, in 82, but the book uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep came out a few years prior to this, so I'm assuming that was in the book. Uh, I've never read it, yeah. so I don't know for ah. sure. No, definitely with that. Something for particular watchers and reader of the book would have been like, oh, you guys should get it. Yes. Now, next week we'll be discussing an episode called Primal Scream. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to be going on a... Uh, uh, Arctic oil expedition, expedition, where ancient cells are discovered that give rise to a ca carnivorous life form and a cover-up. Da da da. Definitely, indeed. Which, now from the sounds of it, is very in interesting. Though I do have to apologize. The instant you told me that title, I, that title of the episode, you thought of the video game. No, something ridiculously stupid popped in my head from an old Disney cartoon. Which is? Uh, I'll chat with you a little later after we finish this episode on it. Okay, because I know nothing about Disney, basically. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, if there's nothing else, that will be uh, it for this week. I've been Paul. And I've been Dave. <laughs>